do is we're going to be looking at dispensationalism and rightly dividing the word. And so what I'm going to do right off the bat is give you the number one reason. Now you might be saying, okay, the number one reason for what? And the answer to that is the number one reason for just about everything. I'm going to give you the number one reason why people don't understand their Bible, the number one reason why their prayers go unanswered, the number one reason why righteous people suffer, the number one reason why there are so many different denominations in the world, the number one reason why people have no purpose in life, um, and uh, the number one reason that people uh, ask the question, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? I, I really believe the Bible has all of the answers to the important questions. If you're looking for those answers outside of the Bible, you're not going to find those answers, and you'll be victimized by the satanic policy of evil. But if, but if you're one of those that does believe that the answers to those questions and many more are in the Bible, th then you, you still may not be able to find the answers that you're looking for because to many people who do believe the Bible has those answers, it's still kind of a closed book to them or at least a confusing one. And so I want to try to clear all that up today. So what is the number one reason for all the confusion and error? The number one reason is because people do not know how to study their Bible dispensationally by rightly dividing the word of truth. That is the issue that is before us today, and I think it's an awfully important one. And, um, and so, it, look, dispensational Bible study gives us all the tools that we need to live our everyday lives and equip us to make wise decisions in life. It gives us purpose. It explains the why of the things that are going on and what God is doing. And so let me just ask you a question. Have you ever been visiting with family? You know, we just got out of the holiday time, so I'm supposing this is probably true for a lot of people. You're sitting around in the living room, and you're talking to family members, and maybe the subject of the Bible or some spiritual things happens to come up. And, and if you're like me, you hear people say a lot of things that are not necessarily right. And you may be wondering whether you should say something or not. Now, you already know what I'm going to say about that. That's a sonship decision that you're going to have to make. Now, for me, I, I'm not always going to say something. But every once in a while, I do. And there are Actually, I just went ahead and, and list. I'm going to list them out for you because people ask me this all the time. How do you know when you ought to say something and when you shouldn't? And so I'm going to give you the six things that I look at that determine if I think I'm going to say something or not. And so here they are. Number one, obviously, if someone asks my opinion about something, then I'm going to make a reply. But my reply, the detail of my reply, uh, is going to vary from one occasion to another. Uh, sometimes someone may make a statement and say, don't you agree with that? And sometimes I just simply say, you know what, I see it a little differently, and I may just leave it at that and see where that goes. But sometimes I go into more detail. Now, the second one is, if I feel like the error that that they're believing is going to present some kind of a danger to them then I'm probably going to say something let me give you an illustration of that if someone really miss in fact this is out of an, an illustration of something we're going to cover later today a, a real event but if a guy was talking to me if one of my family members was talking to me and saying I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to I'm, I'm going to trust God to take care of us and uh, I'm just going to leap out by faith and, and, and live that kind of a life, I would probably say something just to save them because that error in thinking is going gonna, is gonna to make it very difficult in their life. And so I'd want to save them that grief, and so I would probably say something. if I uh, felt. So that's an example of what I'm talking about when I say if the error is particularly dangerous to them. Here's the third thing that would cause me to say something. If what we're talking about is one of the issues of Satan's works of darkness, I think everybody knows what those are. 
but just in case you do not let me just tell you that these are issues that we're going to cover when we get over into Romans chapter 13 and when we get over there you're going to see that there is a concerted effort by Satan to corrupt the divine institution of marriage as God and, and family as God uh, uh, created it and um, and if we're talking about one of the works of darkness which is the substitute for what God has done and the corrupt the corrupted substitute then I'm going to say something the second one is civil law and order and that is the divine institution of human government and if someone uh, is talking about that in the way that Satan is trying to corrupt that divine institution then I'm probably I am going to say something and the last one of course is if it is an attack against the Word of God itself then I'm going to say something these three things these are three issues that the Bible calls works of darkness and in Romans 13 I am told to cast off the works of darkness so if we're having a discussion and one of these issues comes up where the corruption of this is is being talked about in a favorable way or these things are being denigrated then yes I'm going to cast off the I'm going to say something which is how you would cast off those works of darkness so if they ask my opinion yeah I'm probably going to say something if, if I feel like their error is particularly dangerous to them I'm going to say something if it concerns one of these works of darkness I'm going to say something and if the conversation is attacking one of the fundamentals of the faith what are the fundamentals of the faith well the fundamentals of the faith would be the virgin birth of Jesus Christ if someone was having a discussion where they were talking about that wasn't true and that just something that was made up and put in the Bible yeah I'm gonna say something about that because uh, it is one of the fundamentals of the faith how about the inerrancy of the scripture yep if that gets attacked I'm gonna say something uh, and 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 again how much detail kind of depends on the uh, particular uh, situation the next one is the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ I mean if they're talking about um, um, you know the death bear on the resurrection and they have a problem with that then you know I'm I'm, I'm going to say something there's two more that I consider to be fundamentals of the faith the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross if someone is casting aspersion on that probably going to correct that and um, and and uh, say something and um, so when oh, oh well of course and uh, salvation being by grace through faith without works those are what those are what I consider to be the five fundamentals of the faith now I have seen that list change just a little bit but not much but more oh, sorry. so if the conversation is about one of the works of darkness yes I am going to cast off those works of darkness by saying something about that you don't have to say it in a mean-spirited way you don't have to yell shout and get all angry but to 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 defend the truth is the right thing to do fundamentals of the faith that's the fourth area that I'm talking to you about that I d that makes me decide whether or not I'm going to say something the fifth one is if I feel like someone is wanting to know and they're teachable then I may then I will probably say something and I'll try to read that situation as to how much that is let me give you an example of that the guy that delivers UPS out at the house I became friends with him he delivered for years out there it's not there anymore but he delivered for years out there and we kind of struck up a friendship he actually 
got my book on right division and he goes to church over in midland he actually taught it in his sunday school his adult sunday school class over there and so we were we would talk about it from time to time and when he would stop he would ask me <laughs> he'd ask me questions out of the bible and you know and i'd stand there at the ups truck and and we'd talk and um uh, we went out to eat one night, he and his wife and Billy and I, and we went over to a restaurant in Midland, met them over there. And so I asked him, I said, how did you meet? And she was telling me the story. But you know, when she's telling me the story, she's telling it the way that she's used to telling it. And she's talking about how God arranged events and manipulated circumstances and intervened in the situation and kind of caused it all to, you know, come together. And she said, you know, you know what, you know, and I just kept listening and smiling, you know, I'm not going to say anything. And, though, and so finally, it kind of dawns on her, she's in the story, and I haven't said yes to any of that. And she says, you know what I mean, how God does that. And I said, I know what you mean. And she goes, but you agree with that, right? I said, no, but keep telling your story. And she went, wait a minute, you, you don't agree? I said, I don't, but it's okay. Just, I just want to know how you met. Just keep telling your story. And she said, well, wait a minute. If you don't think God's doing that, what do you, what do you think? And uh, this is where Billy rolls her eyes and, you know, passes into a coma. And, uh, you know, and so I, um, I, I said, it, it, it's, this is probably not the time or the place to do that. But, but she wanted, but she really, I, I said, look, can I just give you a short answer and then you can keep telling your story? And she said, yeah. So I did that, and she kept telling her story. But when we walked out into the parking lot, they stood at our car for another 30 minutes because she wanted to know what I really thought about, you know, the kinds of things that she was talking about. And so we talked about it for about a half an hour. I felt like she really wanted to know. She, it wasn't that she wanted to argue but she really wanted to know. And so because I felt like she would hear it, then I did it. So that's the fifth occasion in which I'll say something uh, when I hear something that's not right. And the last one is when the venue is right. In other words, it, it, if, if we're here and someone's asking me a question, well, that's, that's what we're here to do. So, yep, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do that. Um, if I hear during the Q&A that somebody says something that's not exactly right, probably in a very kind way, move them over toward the right way to think about that without embarrassing them. Uh, let me give you another example of a venue that uh, for that. Uh, we have folks that follow along the Pickens um, uh, David and Jane Pickens are up uh, in uh, the Panhandle here in Texas. And uh, years ago, when they first started listening, Billy and I would travel up there every year. We'd stay in a hotel up there, and David had a group of people that were watching the videos. And so he would get them all together, and we would sit in the lobby of the hotel. And we might have 12 people in that lobby, and they'd be asking questions and I'd be answering their questions. And we would sit in there for probably a couple of hours and just do Q&A, and they got a chance to really ask questions about things that they didn't get to do when they were just watching the videos. That's the venue. In other words, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm up there to do. So, yeah. So when they're talking and somebody would say something that wasn't exactly right, Again, in a very kind, non-offensive way, because that is the venue, I would probably, you know, work to correct that thinking. So I've given you the six things that work in my mind that make me s decide I am making a sonship decision to say something here. So just to review those real quickly, if they ask my opinion, well, okay, you ask for it, okay? And um, and so then depending on the situation, um, you know, depends on how much I, I'm, I'm actually going to say about that. Uh, if I felt like what they're thinking is particularly dangerous to them in some way, and I gave you an illustration of that, I would say something. If it concerns one of the works of darkness, I'm going to say something. 
if it is an attack against one of the fundamentals of the faith, I'm going to say something. And if I felt like um, th that they are really wanting to know and that they're teachable, I'll say something. And, um, and then if the venue, if that's what the venue is about, then of course I'll say something. If it doesn't fit one of those categories, then m it, the vast majority of the time, I'm just not going to say anything. I could have given you a seventh, but it kind of works with all of these, and that is the, the time frame isn't always good. Remember when I gave you the illustration about meeting that couple over in Midland, you know, and I said, let me just give you a real short answer, and you keep telling me because I didn't want to, I didn't bring you out here to do a Bible study with you. I just wanted to get to know you. I, you know, I met him all the time. Didn't, I, we'd never met her before. And, um, but sometimes you're in a situation where there's not much time. And so I, you just kind of have to have that in your mind when you make that sonship decision. I think discernment is always the wise thing to do. So it is important to be able to, even if you you may not, correct somebody in a conversation here's the important thing you should know how to defend dispensationalism and rightly dividing the word and this lesson is designed to equip you to do that and the reason is because there is a prevailing school of thought today in churches and theological circles that view dispensationalism as a dirty word I mean, if you just say the word dispensation, people automatically think there's, you know, something wrong with you. They refer to these teachings as dispensational untruth. Uh, Clarence Larkin wrote a book years ago called Dispensational Truth. They call all of that dispensational untruth. To them, if you look at the Bible dispensationally, that is a dangerous heresy that needs to be avoided at all costs. And, and, and but I'm going to say something here and I want everybody done everybody that's listening that listens to this I know you'll identify with this but I want to make the statement and then I want to prove it to you if you seriously study the Bible I mean really seriously study the Bible you probably are in fact I would almost say a hundred percent are to some degree, a dispensationalist, whether you know it or not. You may actually think you're not a dispensationalist, but you are. Which is why it's hilarious to me for people who uh, want, want to, uh, when they find out you're a dispensationalist, they, they want to act like, oh, oh, I, I could never be that. They are that. They are. And I want to prove that to you. First of all, let's take a look at the word dispensation. And I want to show it to you in the Oxford English Dictionary. So here it is. A divinely ordered system or stage in a progressive revelation which is expressly adapted to the needs of a particular people or period of time. That's the number six. Number seven definition the ordering or arrangement of anything in a particular way. Now, you notice the, there is a root word for dispensation. What's that root word? Dispense. And that is the number one definition of a dispensation. When the Bible talks about a dispensation, it's, it, it's not always talking about it in st that strict way because you can dispense a lot of things that don't have anything to do with what the bible is talking about but god is dispensing some things i mean that is that is true uh but you can do that about all kinds of things um it, you can talk about a dispensation of the law in which god dispensed the law and that would certainly be true for the nation of israel um but an easy way to think about dispensations is to think of it this way now someone is going to accuse me of oversimplifying it I'm just trying to get the idea in your mind. A dispensation is a particular way in which God is dealing with people. When he changes 
the way he begins to deal with people, that is a dispensational change. I'm, on, I'm off of the camera, and I've got to remember, don't do that. Sorry. I don't, I don't have the benefit of somebody back there running the recording. So, okay. So, yeah, everybody with me so far? So, the easy way to understand about a dispensation is it's a particular way that God is dealing with people. When he changes and begins to deal with them differently, that is a different dispensation. Now, if you look back at that definition uh, that I gave you on the PowerPoint, it's a divinely ordered system or stage in a progressive revelation. In other words, things are going to progress and they are going to change and God is going to begin to do some things different. So, oftentimes, instead of using the word dispensation, I use the word program. And we have talked about God's prophetic program with Israel. And that means he is dealing in a very particular way with the nation of Israel. Now, in our studies, most of the time, we're mainly concerned with two dispensations. The prophetic program, which is for Israel, and God's mystery program with the church, the body of Christ. And you often hear me, I'm going to use this, this little acronym that I always use, a dispensation of Gentile grace. Now, back when I was first kind of getting all this together, I just called it the dispensation of grace. But I'm calling it the dispensation of Gentile grace because I don't want people to get the idea that grace never showed up until God revealed the mystery to Paul. Because grace is really all through your Bible. Let me run you through just a couple of references real quickly. First of all, and by the way, God has dispensed grace in every dispensation. If he didn't, things would have been, oh, things would have ran off the rails a long time ago. But, uh, but take a look. Here, here, here's the first one. Um, oh, I'm, why, why do I have that one there? Let me see. Well, you know what? I think I have the wrong PowerPoint here. Can you give me just a second? And I hate to do this on the record, uh, uh, but I don't have any... I don't have any choice. So I'm going to. Um, no, that's the one I have. Okay. Hmm. Well, that is unfortunate. Okay. Well, you know what? If you have your notes there, and you can look at them in your notes, those of you uh, that are on Zoom. Tracy sent those notes out to you in an email. If not, let me just give you the reference you can look at in your Bible. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Don't, don't forget what we're looking at here, that grace is way before Paul. Uh, how about uh, Moses in Exodus 32, 12? And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. So Moses found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How about during the days of the Messiah? Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. And talking about Jesus. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And then in the extension of mercy, Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And so we see that grace is not something that, you know, is only manifested in the mystery. And of course, we do see it in the mystery, Acts chapter 20, verse 24, where Paul says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And so he has a gospel that is about grace. And so, there, and look, there's, there are other dispensations. Now, look, we, we don't talk about them all the time, but there is a dispensation of innocence back in the Garden of Eden, a dispensation of human government that happens after the fall. There are dispensations that take place in the future. If you look at our timeline over there, when you see, there's going to be a dispensation of the kingdom one day. And Christ is going to sit on the throne of David and rule the world as king of kings and lord of lords. 
That's going to be a different way, a different thing that's happening. He's going to be dealing with people in a different way, and it's going to be a, a dispensation of the kingdom. And so why are so many people opposed to dispensational Bible th uh, uh, teaching? Well, first of all, I think because they hear bad things about it, and even though they don't understand a lot about it, they, they hear bad things, but they don't actually know what dispensationalism is. Secondly, people sometimes think it's a made-up concept. They go, there's no dispensations in the Bible. But is the word actually in our Bible? It is. Let me just give you three of the examples of dispensation in the Bible. So now we, we come to this. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So this is a future dispensation. In the dispensation of the fullness of times. Now, that's referring to a, 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 a administration that God is going to, in the future, gather all things together into one under Jesus Christ. That's not going on now. So that's a different dispensation. What dispensation are we in? Well, we're in that dispensation of Gentile grace. Let me give you another uh, uh, verse in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 2. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. Who's the you word? That's Gentiles. That's why we call that a dispensation of Gentile grace. If you just call it a dispensation of grace, people think that you mean God didn't ever utilize grace anywhere else in the Bible. But what he did do that's very unique now is that he tore down that middle wall of partition between us and Israel. Israel has fallen to the level of the Gentiles. And now God is dealing with Gentiles apart from the agency of Israel. And so that's why I, I'm calling it the dispensation of Gentile grace. Just kind of save that confusion. But here in Ephesians 3, uh, uh, Ephesians 3 verse 2, Paul says, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So when Paul says that, he says, this thing that was revealed to me, this dispensation of the grace of God, was not known in the past. Guess what? This is a different dispensation. And so, let me give this last one, and this would be in Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. Well, look, if Paul was given a dispensation of this then previously it must have been a dispensation of that everybody with me it's a dispensational change and so uh and now when we read this in Col in colossians you say oh it's a dispensation of god he's talking about who it is that's behind who's the author of the new dispensation in other words paul is saying i didn't make this up this is not my idea that's why he goes into all of that. This was revealed to me, you know, by God. He, he, this is what he's doing. And so that's why he calls it the dispensation of God. Uh, God was dispensing uh, the mystery to Paul, the one that had been hid from ages and generations. And so a dispensation, just to say it again, is a way or a program in which God is dealing with people in a particular way. When he changes the way he's dealing with everybody, then you are changing the dispensation. Everybody with me? So I don't want to make this hard. I want everybody to understand it. Serious, now I'm going to go back to that statement I made. Serious students of the Bible recognize that God has dealt with different people in different ways at different times. And if you do, you're a dispensationalist. 
Now, the only way you're not a dispensationalist is if you think God hasn't changed the way that he's doing things. Dealing with everybody the same. And the message is the same. And the treatment is the same. I personally don't know anybody like that. So I don't know anyone that's not a dispensationalist. And let me, let, and I want to walk you through this because, and this is kind of fun for me to do this. But look, obviously you would say, if you believe that God dealt with Israel under the law and they were under a performance contract, and you believe that Paul said that you're not under the law but under grace and God is not dealing with you under a performance contract, that is not a contradiction, but it's a dispensational change. Everybody with that? People look at that and they go, oh, the Bible contradicts itself. See, that's, that's why you can't get the Bible right if you don't understand dispensational Bible study, if you can't rightly divide the word. Now, if you realize that there's a time when God was dealing with Israel and not with the Gentiles, and then there was a time when God did deal with the Gentiles and no longer dealt with Israel as a nation, then you know about a dispensational change. Now, those are pretty obvious, but it's more than that. So let me back you all the way up to the garden. Let me ask you, are you following the program that God gave to Adam and Eve in the garden? Is there a tree that you're supposed to avoid? I mean, do you have in your backyard the tree of knowledge of good and evil? And God said to you, you know what? You can eat of all the trees. You know what? You can pick up the pecans and you can eat the pears off the tree and, and you can do all of that. But of the tree of knowledge, no, that, you know what? That was God dealing with Adam and Eve in a very particular way. And no one follows that program today. If you don't follow that program, here's what you whether you know it or not, there's been a dispensational change. There's been a change in the administration by which God is dealing with people. So I don't know anyone that's not a dispensationalist. Because I don't know anyone that's still living like they did back in the garden before the fall. I don't know anyone like that. Um... Then, um, if you eat meat instead of just plants, if you're a carnivore instead of a vegetarian or a vegan, then you know what? You realize there's been a dispensational change. Let me show you Genesis 1. Take a look at this. Genesis 1 29 now this is back in right there in the God right and God said behold I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat so originally in the garden what was their meat vegetables and fruits that's what it was. But if you keep reading in your Bible and you get to over there with Noah to Genesis 9, you're going to see that God is now beginning to deal with people differently. So take a look at this with me. Genesis, um, where did that come from? Oh, man. I, I redid this PowerPoint a couple of times, and I think I just have the old, okay, so i got to go back. So can I just read it to you and you can look at it in your notes? Genesis 9, 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Now drop down to verse 3. I just wanted you to see who's being talked to here. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Every, now, what do he say? Every living thing that moveth. What's he talking about here? What, what is he talking about? Is he talking about plants? fruit trees you're talking about animals how many of the animals are okay to eat all of them every single one of them 
finally, in Genesis 9, you can have a hamburger. Okay? In Genesis 1, you had an impossible burger. But in Genesis 9, you get a real hamburger. Okay. Look what else he says. Uh, uh, Even as the green herbs have I given you all things. So he's saying don't eat vegetables. He's not saying don't eat vegetables. He's saying you can eat animal flesh. You can still eat the plants. But look at verse 4. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. In other words, if you're going to eat those animals, you've got to bleed them out. Don't eat the blood. That was the admonition back there for Noah. Don't eat the blood. That's the life of the animal. You bleed them out. I can remember my grandparents lived up in the mountains of Arkansas, and they used to butcher hogs. And a morning like this morning, I, it, I know what it was in Imperial. When I got up this morning in Imperial, it was 22 degrees. What time did you get up? And that would be why. <laughs> Eight. Huh? Fourteen in Monahans. This would have been a perfect morning. You know what they'd have done? They'd have gotten one of those hogs. They'd have shot it right between the eyes. They'd have got his back feet. They'd have hoisted it up over a limb. They'd have had a big barrel of water that was boiling, had a fire under it. They'd have dipped it down in that thing. And when they brought it out of that, I would have been among all those people that was scraping all that hairy hide off of that hog. And then my grandma would slit that thing right down the middle, disembowel it, and they'd start cutting that up for meat. And it was all ha- happening on a very cold morning so that the meat didn't spoil. But you know what they did when they shot it? Here was my point to say that. When they shot it, they immediately cut its throat so it would bleed out that goes all the way back to genesis 9 that was the only stipulation that was the only caveat okay so now having said that from ant so by the way what is that dietary change it's part of a dispensational change From Genesis 9 forward, you could eat animal flesh, but you just couldn't eat the blood, right? You had to do that. And and so that's fine. And then along comes Moses, and God gives him a law. And now it changes again. And what, what can you eat now? Can you eat anything that moves? No. Because that hog I was talking about, you know, slaughtering at my grandparents, that's a no-no under the Mosaic law. That thing has a split hoof. You can't eat that. I I grew up, I was born in Arkansas, but my dad stationed at Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, and then when I got out of Bible college, I went down to South Louisiana for uh, uh, church work down there, and that's Cajun country. And when you get down there in Cajun country, and we did this in North Louisiana too, you know what restaurants are really good at over there? Fried catfish. Man, there was a place down in Baton Rouge called Ralph and Cacoos, and they had this thin cut, you know, they filleted that catfish, thin cut it, and battered it, and fried it, and they bring out a big plate of that fried catfish. Makes you glad you're in the dispensation of Gentile grace. Because if you're a Jew under the law, you can't have catfish, you can't have bacon, you can't, basically, if it tastes good, you can't have it. But there, but, but you understand, there's another change then that comes with the law. And, and those dietary laws are just part of the dispensation of the law and the changes that came along with that. But not everything is about the di- I just used that as an illustration. Not everything was about dietary. Let me ask you a question. How many people do you know that do animal sacrifices to take care of their sins? Now, I don't know anybody that does that. And do you know why? Was there ever a time when there were animal sacrifices in order 
to to um, sacrifice sacrifice for sin. Yeah, I mean that's sitting in the law, isn't it? Sure, it is. Israel did that. Do you do that? Then you know what? If you don't sacrifice animals today, you are a dispensationalist. You recognize there has been a dispensational change. I, that, that's why I just chuckle to myself when someone goes, oh, I'm not a dispensationalist. And I'm thinking, well, where's the tree of knowledge of good and evil for you? Oh, you're not doing that one. Okay. Well, are you, are you just eating fruits and vegetables? Or are you eating anything? Or are you now avoiding pork or, uh, or catfish, you know, without scales, fish without scales? Uh, or, or now are you, see, that's what I'm saying. People, they just don't understand what the dispensations are. They don't understand what they're about. They are practicing dispensationalism. They heard something about it. They didn't really understand it. And so when you're sitting around at your home and people go, well, I would never be a dispensationalist, you can just kind of smile and say, oh, but you are. You are a dispensationalist. And if they say, no, I'm not, you can just say, when did you sacrifice a lamb without blemish on the Day of Atonement and free the scapegoat into the wilderness to pay for your sins for a year? When did you do that? And if they didn't do that, they are a dis They recognize that that was something for somebody, but that is not for them. Y but people don't stop and think. Okay. By the way, if you preach that Christ died for your sins and that after his death on the cross he was buried and he rose from the dead on the third day, if that's what you believe is the gospel today, you are a dispensationalist. Because even during the earthly ministry of Jesus when they were preaching the gospel of the kingdom, do you know what they were preaching over there? They weren't preaching the death on the cross and the burial and the resurrection. They were preaching that Jesus was the prophesied Messiah of Israel and the promised kingdom was at hand. They did not understand about the death, burial, and resurrection, which is why when he died on the cross, they went back to fishing. They thought it was over. So if you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection being the basis for the gospel and, 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 and that Christ paid for your sins on the cross, folks, you're a dispensationalist. So everybody I know is a dispensationalist. Let me make it real easy. Do you believe there's an Old Testament and a New Testament? Then you're a dispensationalist. The only way you're not a dispensationalist is if you just think there's been one program and that's the way it has always been and it hasn't changed. Now, I'm not saying you're a good dispensationalist. It's kind of like, I just say this because I grew up in South Louisiana and that's Catholic country. So Catholic that we're the only state in the Union that doesn't have counties. We have parishes. They were divided up according to the Catholic Church. And so I heard for a lot of years, because I ministered down there in South Louisiana for years and years, people would say, you know, what you talk to some mind, say, do you go to church anywhere? And they go, oh, I'm Catholic. And then, but they would usually, I I'd go, oh, so you go all the time? And they go, well, I didn't say I was a good Catholic. So even though I have said that everybody is a dispensationalist, you're not all good dispensationalists. <laughs> You're kind of like a good Catholic. <laughs> you don't really know much about it. <laughs> but, but you are. Okay. And, and, and so now, now what I want to do is say this. Recognizing dispensationalism in your Bible tells you that you need to rightly divide the word. Let me take you to that. And I sure hope I've got this right on the on the and I don't and I don't oh wait let me see if I can catch it up 
Oh, maybe I did. So here we go. Here we go. So, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if you're a dispensationalist and you understand that 2 Timothy 2.15 is actually the key. Now, there's two things I want to tell you about this verse. What have I got left here? Oh, brother. Did that go off? Oh, well, what a happy accident. Uh, so, okay, well, let me, let me just get to a stopping place here. Two things I want you to see about this verse. The first one is, this verse is not about discerning between truth and error. People think, oh, if I rightly divide the word, then I'm discerning between truth and error. That's not, what does Bible, what does Paul call the Bible in this verse? Rightly dividing the what? The word of truth. How much of that word is truth? Every bit of it is truth. So he's not talking about discerning truth from error. He's talking about making proper divisions in the truth. In other words, discerning between something that was true over here for this person, but something else that is true for someone else. Everybody get that? So that's the first thing I want to point out, is that he's not really talking about discerning between truth and error, but he's talking about dividing the truth. Here's the second thing about this, and that is that rightly dividing the word of truth is based on God's dispensational actions and instructions. In other words, if you understand about the dispensations, then the right division comes easy. By the time you get to 2 Timothy, you've already seen dispensational changes. And so, uh, but people have the idea because the word dispensation isn't sitting in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that that's not what he's talking about. But it is what he's talking about. Let me give you an example. Three kids at home, I have three kids, and so those, if I bring home a bag of candy and I say, I want y'all to divide this up so that you all have the same amount of pieces, if it doesn't come out even, bring me the extras what am i saying about their portions i want each of their portions to be what oh thank you you knew that without me using the word i didn't have to say make them equal because of what i was saying you understood what that meant that's exactly what second timothy is going to do and if you read past verse 15 you will see that in the passage he is going to tell you this is all dependent upon observing the dispensations. The word doesn't have to be there in order for us to understand that. So let me get to the stopping place by reading the passage and then we'll stop, take a break and come back and pick it up. Second Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness and their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus who concerning the truth have erred saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some I want you to notice that what these two guys were saying is what what are they saying about the resurrection that it's past and that was a bit of a problem okay now I'm gonna just leave the cliffhanger right there yeah okay no 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 Rachel that's okay yes yes the resurrection of believers actually since you brought that up let me just end the session with this <laughs> that bought me another minute so when he says the resurrection here what is he actually talking about first of all you know it's not the resurrection at the end because that doesn't happen until Christ comes back and puts down his enemies and gets ready to set up the kingdom and then there's this resurrection to go in. You know, you, you know that because he's not there in Jerusalem sitting on the throne. So you know that's not it. What is he talking about? He is talking about the blessed hope or what people come and refer to as the rapture because these are members of the body of Christ. When do they get resurrected? at the very end of the dispensation of Gentile grace at the blessed hope. 
That's when, remember, the dead in Christ rise first, and then we which are alive, we get changed. So that's what they're talking about. And so what are these guys saying? That, that has already happened. Now, if that's already happened, where do they think they are? Oh, okay. Melinda says, in the kingdom. Be a little more specific. If, if the blessed hope has taken place, yeah, you're in the tribulation. You're back in Israel's program. And if you're back in Israel's program, what is back in effect? Thank you, the law. The law. Take a look at this. By the way, did anybody ever say there was... These guys, are they saying there's no such thing as a resurrection? They're just saying what? It's already, in the, it's already taken place. Were there ever some people that denied the resurrection? Sure, take a look. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So in Corinth, there were some people like that. But these guys weren't denying the resurrection. They got confused about the timing of the resurrection. Now, I do want to say more about that, but let me just leave it with this. You know what dispensationalism is? The only thing dispensationalism is, is drawing a timeline and putting all the events on the timeline where they're supposed to go. That's, I'm, I'm just putting it in a nutshell. You know what they did? They got something wrong on the timeline. They put the resurrection in the past. They weren't saying there wasn't one. They just got the timing wrong. Okay, so we're going to come back and pick this up because it's very, very interesting to see here, and we need time to look at it. All right, so we'll stop here, take a break, and then we'll come back in just a few minutes.